I'm not American, but I want to be what America says it is. Everyone does. It's the American dream, the pursuit of life, liberty, and happiness. Not to mention equality, freedom, democracy. <laughs> Every four years, Americans are presented with a choice to pick the direction they want their country to go, to make their voices heard, and elect the leader they want to represent them. Hello and welcome to Animation Propaganda. Last time, we took up smoking and saw how cartoon characters shield cigarettes. Today, we are wrapping up Season 2 by delving into the American electoral process and seeing how cartoons have ran for president. We're going to be looking not only at animated political ads, but also some notable live-action ones, and even fictional campaigns ran by famous characters. Now, I know this is a very stressful time and topic for a lot of people right now, so we are going to be keeping it relatively light, uh, informative, but hopefully fun. Let's get to it. America was in the midst of war during the 1944 election, which pitted Republican Thomas E. Dewey against the incumbent Franklin Roosevelt. Roosevelt is something of an anomaly when it comes to presidents. Uh, for one, he was serving unprecedented four terms. Uh, this was before the passing of the 22nd Amendment that officially limited a president's terms, but two, had been the time-honored tradition. Now, there were two major contributors to Roosevelt serving four, the first being the Great Depression, he was elected in 1932, three years into the Depression, and had campaigned on the promise of a New Deal for Americans. This New Deal would be executed as a series of policies and programs that provided relief to citizens, as well as economic recovery and reform. Among many things, out of this came Social Security, Welfare, various public works projects, and new labor regulations, including the right of collective bargaining and a minimum wage. Roosevelt came around at an interesting time. The Great Depression had revealed serious flaws in America's capitalist system, and Europe nations had begun adapting newer political ideologies, communism and fascism. It is very possible America could have as well, if not for the success, or at least the promise, of the New Deal in restoring many people's faith in democracy. This was reflected in the 1933 Walter Land short, Confidence. It stars Oswald the Lucky Rabbit, who we talked about in episode 2. Here he stars as a farmer. Uh, farmers were hit hard by the Depression, portrayed in this short as death. It wreaks havoc on the farm and leaves the animals dazed and confused. We see a mob outside a bank clamoring for their money. The market crashes. All of this causes Oswald to have a mental breakdown. He runs to a doctor, who directs him to a photo of FDR, saying, This is your doctor. Oswald then flies to Washington and meets with the president, who sings, with assurance, that the curve for depression is confidence. I don't know why I never thought of that. <laughs> this satisfies Oswald, who flies back home using Thomas Jefferson's bow and wig, and he arrives to the hope of a new day. But not everybody supported the New Deal. Here, we have an attack ad from the 1936 election, which found Republican Alf Landon challenging Roosevelt. This was produced and circulated by the Sentinels of the Republic, a right-wing lobby group that opposed the New Deal, as well as child labor regulations. It should come as no surprise, the ad takes a condescending tone. It shows Uncle Sam reading a newspaper in April 1929. His mail is nothing but bills for aiding other countries in World War I, uh, and of course taxes. FDR then shows up riding a donkey, the symbol of the Democratic Party. Our narrator tells us that they don't know where they're going, as we see a signpost to the poorhouse and another to Utopia, going every which way. Now this short runs wild with its allegories. <laughs> the donkey, now branded the New Deal jackass, gets hitched to the Democratic platform. He is given Russian vodka, uh, which I see as anti-communist fear-mongering, and the donkey runs roughshod. It destroys the platform, spills the recovery beans, <laughs> and tramples the corn and cotton before running into another donkey representing constitutional Democrats. The short ends with Uncle Sam hitching himself to that donkey and the GOP's elephant. FDR would defeat Landon in one of the biggest landslides in U.S. history. He would win again, comfortably, in 1940, when he ran for a third term, a decision made given the uncertainty of World War II. While his first two terms were dominated by domestic policies and issues, his second two focused on global affairs, you know, war, obviously. With the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, America was formally brought into the war, and Roosevelt was tasked with carrying the nation through yet another crisis. He did so, and was still highly favored by the time the 1944 election came around. Despite his popularity, the film Hellbent for Election was produced to further build support. This is a pro-labor film directed by the legendary Chuck Jones. It was sponsored by the United Auto Workers, UAW, a union which gave me a very good life. 
It was produced by Industrial Films, which later became UPA, the United Productions of America. It is largely allegorical, with trains being used as the candidates and the switchman representing the American public. One of the trains, the Win the War Special, is a streamlined train built in the image of the incumbent, obviously Franklin Delano Roosevelt, FDR. It pulls the weaponry needed to win the war. Meanwhile, his opponent, Thomas E. Dewey, pulls the Defeatist Limited. It is a steam train, numbered 1929, after the year the stock market crashed, and pulls hot air, as well as a sleeper and hearse car, labeled Labor Legislation, and one dedicated to Jim Crow laws. The Switchman is tempted by a saboteur, who at one point morphs into Hitler to turn against Roosevelt. Uh, he experiences a terrible nightmare, which sees Dewey win, taxes increase, and wages freeze. This causes him to take action, send the Defeatist Limited off the rails, and the Win the War special straight to Washington. The short ends would look at the future and the promise of jobs, security, and victory. The short is hyper-stylized, as were a lot of UPA cartoons. It is overt in its political messaging and makes no attempt to hide its bias. Uh, this was not an official campaign ad, but the UAW supporting Roosevelt, who once again won re-election in dominant fashion and would die in office shortly before the war ended. An ongoing theme of this season has been television and the role it's played in promoting propaganda. While radio was still relevant, 1952 really feels like the year TV broke through, especially in terms of American politics. We had live election coverage on the air. Now, the 1948 election had been covered on TV, but the 1952 presentation feels like a more familiar antecedent to modern coverage. What you are seeing here is from CBS, Edward Murrow, and my boy, Walter Cronkite. It may not look like much, but this was revolutionary in terms of presentation and the technology used. They could broadcast live images of the candidate's headquarters. <laughs> they had an early computer, a Univac, to help them predict the winner, which it did correctly. Uh, they actually referred to it as he, which is kind of funny. We will see how the media adapts as technology changes over the years, but for Election 52, a gendered mechanical brain was mind-blowing. This election pitted Democrat Adlai Stevenson against Republican Dwight D. Eisenhower, who would win, marking the first Republican victory in 24 years. It is notable, as it was the first election where candidates could purchase television airtime to run campaign ads. Of course, this was harnessed better by Eisenhower, who used the budding medium to draw voters. In one of the most famous campaign ads of all time, we see a procession of people marching to a tune composed by Irvin Berlin, uh, who also gave us God Bless America, with lyrics repeating the simple slogan, You like Ike, I like Ike, everybody likes Ike. It highlights no issue, it doesn't outline a platform, only celebrates Eisenhower, uh, though it does have some subtle symbolism. Uncle Sam leads the charge, Stevenson is at one point seen riding a donkey, again, mascot of the Democrats, running backwards in the background. This song is extremely infectious, uh, superficially the ad is very positive, everyone is smiling, the music is upbeat, and associating this energy with a candidate, it's no surprise he won by a large margin. Stevenson would also use television, uh, but less successfully. Uh, he too ran animated ads. This fantastic one features Alan Reed, the voice of Fred Flintstone, accusing the GOP of double talk. A Twitter politician offers conflicting takes on a number of issues, including the war in Korea and the rising threat of the Iron Curtain. This highlighted the splintering of the GOP into conservative and moderate wings. Eisenhower was more liberal than traditional Republicans. Uh, there is something of an urban legend that says Stevenson lost because one of his ads superseded an episode of I Love Lucy. It apparently resulted in a ton of complaints and caused quite the backlash. A decade later, the political landscape had changed. Where once Eisenhower and even Kennedy promoted hope, or at the very least, positivity, there was now fear. Fear of an ultimate enemy. Fear of incompetence. I am, of course, talking about the most infamous campaign ad of all time, Lyndon Johnson's Daisy Spot. It is an extremely simple ad. It starts with a young girl counting daisy petals. When she hits nine, she stops, and a man's voice begins counting down to a missile launch. We zoom in on her eye, and a nuclear bomb goes off. A narrator informs us that these are the stakes, and that we must love each other, or we must die, before Vote Johnson is displayed on the screen. This was in response to his opponent, Barry Goldwater's cavalier attitude towards using atomic weapons. Uh, now Johnson's whole ad campaign is pretty batshit, uh, for lack of a better word. 
Here we have the similar ice cream ad. It features another young girl eating ice cream as the narrator explains the chemicals and atomic bombs and Goldwater's opposition to a treaty banning the testing of them. We also have Confessions of a Republican. This was an extended ad with a young Republican explaining why Goldwater is different and more dangerous than past candidates. This was obviously a ploy to get moderate Republicans, but by far the most absurd ad is the KKK for Goldwater. This presented footage of the Ku Klux Klan and racist quotes from the leader of their Alabama chapter, Robert Creel, who also voiced his support for Goldwater, implicating he may have ties to the organization. Things would just get worse. In 1968, Nixon ran this ad, designating himself as a law and order president. We see photos of civil rights protests, framing them as a threat to society. We are told, also, to vote like our whole world depends on it. Looking at these, it's not hard to see why the country has ended up so divided. They use the same tone and techniques they had with the Soviets, or even the Japanese in the 40s, only on each other, fellow Americans. Going from election to election and seeing how the election nights were covered is also very interesting. Uh, some nights are early, a winner is called within hours, while others last long into the night. You also see the evolution of issues. When Nixon came into office, the trending issue was law and order. <laughs> when he left, it was faith and trust in government. But I don't want you to think that it's all bad, and that fear was the only way people were encouraged to vote. Politicians and organizations have long tried to target younger voters and instill in them the importance of voting. Youth voter turnout is on the rise in America, but traditionally it has been low. In 1990, Virgin Records America co-chair Jeff Ayeroff hoped to change this with Rock the Vote. This was a nonprofit created in response to censorship in the music industry, mainly the attempted banning of the hip hop group Two Life Crew's album, As Nasty As They Wanna Be. The word censorship gets thrown around a lot these days, in my opinion, improperly, but this was straight up the government trying to outlaw expression. The Rock the Vote campaign encouraged youth to vote and become involved in politics, make their voices heard. They hoped that their values would align with the music industries. <laughs> they partnered with MTV and produced a series of PSAs in which several rock stars encouraged you to do something cool and vote. Spokespeople included famously Madonna, Iggy Pop, LL Cool J, Chuck D from Public Enemy, and the Red Hot Chili Peppers, Anthony Kiedis. Rock the Vote has continued encouraging the youth to vote, though it has been criticized for promoting itself as nonpartisan, uh, yet disproportionately highlighting left-leaning issues. However, their efforts have contributed to a rise in youth voter registration, which is always a good thing. The Simpsons has not shied away from politics during its 31 years on the air. They have covered a wide range of issues, from immigration in Much Apu About Nothing to gun rights in the Cartridge family. They have also taken many shots at politicians and political conventions. Now, there are so many presidential references peppered in The Simpsons, I am not going to name them all, but there's a few I want to look at, starting with Season 3's Mr. Lisa Goes to Washington. In this episode, Lisa wins a trip to Washington after writing an essay detailing what she thinks makes America great. Upon arriving in the Capitol, she becomes disillusioned seeing a member of Congress accept a bribe. She then pens another essay, Cesspool on the Potomac, <laughs> outing the congressman for corporate lobbying and political corruption. Because of her actions, she loses the contest, but the congressman is arrested and her faith in the system is restored. The Simpsons return to political corruption three seasons later with Sideshow Bob Roberts, which takes its name from the Tim Robbins film about a right-wing folk singer who runs for Senate. While Sideshow Bob Roberts features a mayoral election, it parodies and references many real-world events surrounding the presidency. This episode pitted Sideshow Bob against Joe Quimby for mayor of Springfield. During the debate, Quimby has a cold and performs poorly on account of it. This echoes a 1960 debate between Richard Nixon and John F. Kennedy, uh, where Nixon also had a cold. <laughs> he was sweating throughout. Sideshow Bob's ad attacks Quimby for releasing Sideshow Bob, who was twice convicted of attempted murder. This is a parody of a 1988 Bush Sr. ad that attacked Michael Dukakis for being soft on crime. Uh, there are actually two prominent spots, uh, one famously known as the Willie Horton spot, which profiled a convicted murderer who escaped and repeatedly offended uh, after getting out on a weekend pass, which Dukakis supported. There is also the more direct source, which showed a rotating door prison. The episode riffs on Republicans, portraying them as rich and evil. <laughs> the character Birch Barlow is also a spoof of right-wing talk show host Rush Limbaugh. Uh, pundits like Limbaugh are hugely influential in swaying public opinion. 
A large part of the plot also concerns the Watergate scandal, and many scenes parody the film All the President's Men, based on the book by Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein. However, what is probably The Simpsons' most important and enduring piece of political satire would come in 1996 with Citizen Kane. Now, this was a segment on their annual Halloween special, Trios of Horror. It featured the aliens Kane and Kodos assuming the roles of presidential opponents Bill Clinton and Bob Dole. Honorable mention to Ross Perot, who ran as the third-party candidate, you know, go ahead and throw your vote away, for the second straight election. This episode or segment does so much in just seven minutes. It comments on politicians' perception of voters, you know, abortions for some, and miniature American flags for others, <laughs> as well as partisan politics and America's two-party system. Uh, their election coverage is titled America Flips a Coin, obviously the choice between Kane and Kodos, and the idea, uh, like I just mentioned there, that voting third party is throwing your vote away. As cynical as it may seem, it also features a heartfelt dialogue between the two real candidates who decide they are stronger together and team up before being released into space. Ultimately, the planet is doomed and humanity is enslaved. When presented with this fact, Homer comments, Don't blame me, I voted for Kodos. So pretty much everything we've looked at in this video has been rooted in a real-life election, be it an ad or a parody. However, many prominent cartoon characters <laughs> over the course of time have ran for president as well. In 1933, Betty Boop ran for president, which was progressive thinking for the 30s. Uh, obviously, America has still yet to elect a woman president. Uh, she campaigned for a personalized public transit that picked you up at your door, a city-sized umbrella, and most bizarrely, replacing capital punishment with a makeover. The short ends with a reference to alcohol, which was still prohibited during production. Uh, that was another thing the New Deal covered. It repealed prohibition. We have been looking at Cartoon Network a lot lately, and during the 2000 election season, they ran a series of interstitials masked as political ads. I think this is a great way to introduce kids to politics <laughs> and attack ads. Those running that I could find at least included Brack, whose ad parodied the I Like Ike ad <laughs> with his face covering Eisenhower's. Cow and Chicken's Red Guy, who frames his ad around regular working-class Americans, you know, he cares. Speaking of chicken, his ad attacks Foghorn Leghorn for being a one percenter. Uh, he's out of touch and he likes it that way. Huckleberry Hound's ad has not aged the best. Uh, it is an attack on Fred Flintstone, who apparently doesn't stand for family values because he cross-dresses, drinks, and dances with other men. Yogi Bear ran his ad, spoofing the Daisy Spot and attacking his opponent, Marvin the Martian. Bugs Bunny appealed to nostalgia and his accomplishments, uh, while Scooby-Doo was out for the unheard. They actually held a contest uh, slash election in the build-up to announcing the winner, <laughs> and uh, held a marathon of cartoons featuring the candidates. Scooby won, uh, with nearly 18% of the vote. He had the most impassioned ad, at least in my opinion, you know, it worked on me. They even honored him on President's Day with a parade and a marathon. Cartoon Network would repeat this in 2004. A lot changed in those four years, 9-11, uh, <laughs> and these ads highlight that. Uh, they ask uh, if you're older and position one of the Eds from Ed, Ed, and Eddie as incumbent rather than Scooby, which is kind of weird. 2004 also gave us South Park's most famous take on elections, Douche and Turd. Now the plot of this episode is PETA protests South Park Elementary for using the cow as a mascot, and so the town holds an election to pick a new one, with the candidates being a giant douche and a turd sandwich. Now the take here is that both candidates are awful and your vote really doesn't matter, uh, which is a pretty shitty take. It was disingenuous then to present both candidates as equally bad, that was Carrie Bush, and it's disingenuous now. South Park creators, Trey Parker and Matt Stone, apparently have realized this and grown in their opinion. In their recent pandemic special, they encourage viewers to vote, which is what I'm doing as well. Yes, another season has passed. No grand statement. Everything I said last year about trusting a reality is still very relevant. So all I will say is that if you are lucky enough to have the privilege, vote. So that wraps up another season of Animation Propaganda. Maybe we'll be back next year. Maybe there will be a next year. I don't know. Vote. Now, this was not meant to be exhaustive. I'm sure I missed some stuff, so feel free to chime in in the comments, which I will leave on, so long as we can all behave. If you enjoyed this video, check out the rest of this series, give us a thumbs up, and subscribe if you haven't. I know it's tough out there, but if you have the means, please consider supporting us on Patreon. That's the only place to see Century of Schlock, our exploration of trash media for the 20th century. Right now we're looking at animated smut. That's patreon.com slash Thanks for watching. 
Stay safe, everybody.